It is good to gather with you this morning. It's great to see a packed house here, to hear you sing. Uh, and thanks for bearing with us in our technical issues we have this morning. But I'm glad that we are here for one reason. Not because we have a great sound system or because we have an awesome band, as good as they are. Thank you, Ben, for uh, leading us this morning. But we're here to, to worship the Lord together. And, and I praise God for that, that you all have come to do just that. And I'm reminded, as we, as we hear one another sing, as we're a little bit more stripped down this morning, hear one another sing what Colossians 3 says. Colossians 3.16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You see, what Paul tells the Colossians is that they are to sing and to teach and to admonish one another through song, through singing these hymns and these spiritual songs to one another. And so it's good for us to be singing to one another and hear one another sing aloud as we praise God together this morning. So I praise God for that, and I'm thankful that you're here. We're going to jump into our sermon this morning. Uh, welcome. If you don't know me, my name's Sean. Uh, I serve as one of the pastors here at Harbor. We're continuing our sermon series, the Gospel of Mark. So grab your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9. If you want a Bible this morning, our ushers would be happy to give you one. Please raise your hand. That's our gift to you. Take that home. Read it. Study it. Love God's Word. We need to have more of God's Word in our lives. And so take one of those. And if you just want to borrow it for this morning, that's fine too. You can give it back to us at the end. We'll give it to someone else next week. But grab your Bibles. Turn to Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50. Now, as you're doing so, let me ask you a question. What is greatness? Greatness. It's a thing we seem to strive after, the thing we want, the thing we desire. We all want to be great. We want to do great things in our world. The American dream is a dream of greatness, isn't it? to have a family and children and a solid job and a, a nice house and the picket fence and a dog and you know all the things, all so we can be great and comfortable and, and have ease. Greatness is the American dream. Greatness is the American way. We are, want to be the greatest nation in the world, don't we? We want to live in the greatest time of all of history. We want to do great things in this world, and our culture just breathes this into us over and over and over again. Think about the Olympics. Who wants to get a bronze medal? Nobody, right? You want to get the gold medal. You want to be great. We want our team, we want the Americans to have all the gold medals so we can say we're the greatest nation ever. And all the other nations are the exact same thing. In business, we want to have the best. We want to have the greatest. We want to have the, the most successful business plan and just be seen as a, a great business leader. How about on social media? We have all of our Instagram posts because we want to show the greatest food and just be seen as the greatest person, have the most followers, and we want to be great over and over and over again. And we pursue that in our day like nothing else. We want to be great. And so we do things to make sure that we are seen as great. Again, social media, how many people can I have following me? I'll hire a coach to help me be better, to be stronger, to do more, to work harder, to dig deeper, to sacrifice everything for the sake of my goals, all so that I can be great. Be thought of well in this world. Be thought of as someone who is significant, a person of prominence. We want greatness in our world, don't we? American culture seems to breed this into us. I have a more important question for us this morning to ponder. What does Jesus say about greatness? You see, for Christians in this room, we ought to be concerned with what Jesus has to say with the topic of greatness. If this is a thing we desire, what would Jesus have to say about it? And friends, let me tell you, the way of Jesus is vastly different than the way of the world and the greatness that we pursue today. In fact, one commentator I read this week said this, at no point does the way of Jesus diverge more sharply from the way of the world than the question of greatness. At no point is there more difference in the way of greatness from what the world says and what Jesus says. And what I want us to see this morning is what Jesus would teach us about the issue of greatness. What does it mean to be great in the kingdom of God? And so today, that's what we're going to see. We're going to look at Jesus' teaching on this subject of greatness. We come to this point in the text in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50, where Jesus is going to predict his death yet again. We've seen this a couple weeks ago. We saw Jesus predict his death and his resurrection, and then we see it again here, and in a few weeks, we'll cover it again. Three different times, Mark will have Jesus speak of his income and his impending death and resurrection. And it's fascinating to me that each time Jesus predicts his death, there's some sort of failure of the disciples. 
They just get it totally wrong. They just blow it massively. He says, I'm going to go to die. I'm going to rise. And there's some sort of controversy, something that they just, they just totally miss and get wrong. And so then Jesus has to take time to teach them about what it means to follow him as his disciples. We see this every time it comes up, three different times. A couple weeks ago, it was Peter. Peter has this great confession. Jesus says, I'm going to die. And Peter says, no way, not on my watch, not at all. You're never going to be going to your death. No, no, Jesus, not at all. And so Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan, and then teaches his disciples about what it means to follow him. And today we see something similar. He's gonna speak about his incoming, his impending death. And then he will see the disciples fail and it, resolve, it revolves around this idea of greatness and the idea of humility. And so Jesus will respond to their failure by teaching what it means to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And I would submit to you this morning this, that greatness in the kingdom of God is the pursuit of the humility and the holiness of Christ. Let me say that again. Greatness in the kingdom of God is the pursuit of the humility and the holiness of Christ. This is what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. As we pursue humility, as we pursue holiness, holiness we do so as Jesus did it. And this is what Mark wants us to see from the text this morning. That to be great in the kingdom of heaven means we must pursue holiness and humility in this life. Jesus will tell us what it means to pursue radical holiness. He'll give us examples of what it means to be humble in this life. And we do all of this because Jesus goes to the cross to be our example and to make it possible for us to pursue these things in him. That's what I want you to see in the text this morning. So as we read and as we move through our sermon this morning, see if that is true. See if you see these things in the text, that greatness in the kingdom of God is about the pursuit of the humility and holiness of Christ. Let's turn to God's word and see what he would say to us this morning. Mark chapter nine, beginning at verse 30. And they, this is the disciples and Jesus, they went from there and passed on through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not him, but him who sent me. And John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him. For the one who, is, who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak, will not soon be able afterward to speak evil of my name. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Father God and gracious Lord, we come before you now asking that you would speak. Lord, you are a speaking God. You are a revealing God. And that is what we long for this morning. God, no one needs to hear my words today. What we need are your words and your thoughts. We need to hear from you. We need to know what you would say to us today. For you have the words of life and it's by your word that we are changed. And so Lord, would you do that work to speak now, Lord? Would you help us to hear? May your words come through this morning and not my own, Lord. 
Father, you said he has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's what we want to have, ears that would hear, eyes that would see, hearts open and willing to respond. And so speak to us this morning, Lord, and do so in the power of your spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Remember, disciples pursue humility. Disciples pursue holiness. And we do all of this because Jesus went to the cross. This is what I believe our text says to us this morning. So let's dive in and we'll see where Mark teaches us these things. We begin verses 30 to 32. We see this prediction of Jesus, the second passion prediction where Jesus speaks of his coming death. What does he say? It's pretty clear in verse 31. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Again, the second prediction of Jesus' coming death. We've seen all along the identity of Jesus up to this point. Who is Jesus? Who is this person? Who is the Messiah? And that's what we've seen. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one who walks on water. He is so many things that is revealed in the gospel of Mark. And then we pivot to see not who Jesus is, but how he will live out his role as the Messiah. He's the one who must go to the cross to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. They will put him to death, and after three days, he will rise. This is how Jesus will be the Messiah. And he tells us to his disciples plainly, he's going to be delivered, he's going to be killed, and he will rise. And that seems pretty clear to us, doesn't it? Like, there's no ambiguity there. This is exactly what Jesus is going to do. But we have the benefit of, you know, look through the entire story. We know where Jesus is going. We know he will go to the cross, but the disciples didn't. And in this moment, they they don't seem to get it. They don't seem to quite understand what Jesus is saying. Mark tells us for the benefit of the story, you know, what Jesus is going to do, but the disciples are a little bit confused. And in fact, Mark tells us in verse 32, but they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Over and over and over again, we see failures of these disciples. And here, they don't get Jesus' clear teaching, his clear words. They do not understand why. And we might might speculate, like we might speculate what is going on here. Maybe Jesus wasn't clear. Maybe he was saying some things that are kind of obscure, or, or maybe he's sort of speaking to confound. He teaches some parables to sort of confound the wisdom of the wise, but to give uh, insight to those who, who would receive. So maybe Jesus is being maybe intentionally unclear here. They could be, that's possible. Or maybe they just couldn't fathom that the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man would go to the cross and die. Maybe they couldn't understand, still partially blind, needing eyes to see. But what we do know is they were afraid to ask. Friends, there's something here for us. If there's something you're unclear about in God's word, something you're unclear about in what God has said to you, don't be like the disciples who are afraid to ask Jesus. Simply speak up and ask. God loves to answer your prayers, loves to answer your questions. If you don't understand, simply ask. Do not be like these disciples who don't understand and are afraid to ask. But instead, seek the Lord and receive the insight that you need. But it's clear. Mark tells us they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. And then he furthers this. He continues on to show us more of the failure of these disciples. Jesus is going to go to his death. He's going to rise, and the the disciples don't get it. And we continue in verses 33 through 42. Look with me at verses 33 and 34. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, this is fascinating to me. This is just so funny. Jesus has a question for them. What were you discussing on the way? Now, did Jesus, is that a question like, hey, I don't know what you were saying, so please tell me what you were talking about? Not probably not. If you're a parent in the room, you ask your kids questions a lot that you already know the answer to, right? Hey, where did the cookies go in the cookie jar? I don't know. I don't know what happened to those, right? It's so fascinating. When something bad happens, no one ever knows what happened to it. Parents know, but the kids, they just, I don't know, someone, something happened, right? It's kind of like this in this situation. Now, Jesus knows exactly what he's asking. What were you guys discussing on the way? It's possible that Jesus, touching his divinity, touching his omniscience, just knows, just intrinsically knows all things, and so he knew exactly what the disciples were talking about. But it's probably more likely that Jesus, in his humanity, just, just heard. 
he probably heard whisperings or maybe arguments or whatever it was. He just, he knew what they were discussing along the way. And so he asked them, what were you discussing? And like my kids do oftentimes, like many do, the disciples knew they were caught. They were caught in their failure. And so what do they do? They say nothing at all. They for surely had argued about who was greatest and they knew that was not the right thing. And so they kept silent. Like children, they didn't fess up to what was going on. You know, I have, I've seen these videos. I mean, you probably have seen them too online. Like, like a dog will get into the trash or get into something uh, and you know, the parent's away, the owner's away and they come back and the house is just destroyed and, and wrecked and they, they go and they confront the dog and it's like, who did this? And the dog's like, I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I, I don't want to see you right now. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. I just see the disciples in this sort of, oh man, we're, we're, we're caught here and, 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 and I don't want to tell Jesus what we were talking about. But Mark makes it clear. What were they arguing about? Who among us is the greatest? This is crazy. Jesus just said, I'm going to die. I'm going to Jerusalem to be killed, to be delivered into the hands of men. And after three days, I will rise. Massive, incredible truce. And what do they do in the very next scene? Argue amongst themselves about who is greater than who. They don't care about what Jesus is going to do. They care about who is the most prestigious among them, who it is among their group who is the greatest. They care about who's the greatest. Why do we care about that so much? Why is that the concern of the American way and the American dream? Why is that the concern of the disciples? Why do they want to know who among them is the greatest? Well, deep, deep down, I think there's a core part of our fallen nature that gives us over to this this sense of wanting to be the greatest. Fundamentally, the question of who is the greatest is a question about pride. Ever wonder what the worst sin is? Ever thought about what does God hate the most or what was the most egregious sin? I might submit to you, pride is probably way up there. If not the worst sin, it's definitely up there on the scale. Pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. In heaven, Satan was there, one of the angels. And in his pride, in his arrogance, he tried to rob God of his glory and God will not share his glory with another. And so Satan and a third of the angels were cast out into this world. It was pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. And in us, pride was the very, very first sin of our first parents. Remember the story of Adam and Eve in the garden? They're there by the tree. Eve is by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does the serpent come and do? He asks her a question. He said, did God really say? And he gets her to question some things and to think about, well, what what did God say? And he twists God's word a little bit. But what was it that really was the kicker for Eve? He said, when you eat the fruit, you will be like God. You will be great. You will be made much of in this world. You will become like the greatest in all of the universe. You will be like God. And in that moment, Eve saw that the fruit was delightful for the eyes, that would make her wise, that would make her great like God was. And so she took the fruit, she ate and gave it to her husband. And from that point forward, from the very, very first days of Adam and Eve, we had been given over to the same sense of pride, of making much of ourselves. We want to be like them. We want to be like God. We want to be like the great one, the greatest in all of the universe. This cry for freedom and autonomy and and all of these things that we desire so much are at their base, at their root, pride. We want to be like God. We want to be the greatest. And so many of the sins of our day can be traced right back to this very same root, which is pride. Here's a great definition I heard of pride. Pride is when sinful human beings aspire to the status and position of God and refuse to acknowledge the dependence upon him. We want to be great because we want to be in control. We want to be not dependent upon God, but dependent upon ourselves. And in our pride, we aspire to the status and position of God. And I've heard it said that on the moral ladder and the hierarchy of sins, that those who are prideful are on the bottom rung. They're looking up at the prostitutes, the sexually immoral, the the drug addicts, the liars, all these other people. Prideful people are at the bottom sort of rung because at least those who are in egregious sorts of sins outwardly know they need help, know they need God to deliver them. But those who are prideful are dependent upon themselves. And we all are given over to the same sense of wanting to be great, wanting to be prideful. What about you? Is that true of you? 
I see this tendency all around us, all over the place. There's so many ways in which we want to be made great in this day. It's outside in our culture, and it seeps into the church in many ways. I see it all around us. Political slogans, make America great because we want to be great. Our greatest days are ahead. We want to be made much of. I see it outside, and I see it inside, and I see it in my own heart in so many ways. I want to be in control. I want to rely on myself. I want to be the one who is made great and is seen as this awesome person. And people who stand behind platforms on stages, it is dangerous because that pride can creep in very subtly, but it can take you down a road of absolute destruction. But what about you, friend? Do you have that tendency in your own life towards pride, arrogance, wanting to elevate yourself to the status of God, to the position of God, where you refuse to acknowledge him in your life and your dependence upon him? Where do you see this tendency in you towards pride? Rather than think about Jesus' impending death, these disciples were focused on their own desire for greatness. And so Jesus has to pause his journey. He has to pause along the way and correct them and teach them about the way of true greatness. Look at verse 35 with me. We see Jesus begin to teach them. And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if any would be first, he must be last of all and the servant of all. Here Jesus sits down to teach them. It's his official capacity as a rabbi. It signals that the words that are to follow are massively important to Jesus and to those who would hear him. And what does he say? If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Translation, if you want to be great, here's how you will be great in the kingdom of God. If you want to be first, if you desire to be great, here's what you must do. You must be last of all and the servant of all. You see, Jesus teaches his disciples, disciples are to be last, not first. They're not to think of themselves as great and pursue their own greatness. They're to pursue the health, the wealth, or not the wealth, the kind, the goodness, the care of those who are least in this world, as we'll see in just a minute. Disciples are to be last in this life, and they are to be servants of all, last of all and servants of all. And now I think it's important that Jesus says, to be servants of all, not just servants of some, but servants of all. Because I think even in being a servant, there are times we can distort that and think much of ourselves. Imagine if you're the servant to a great king, a mighty emperor, someone who's in high power and high authority. There's some prestige even in being that person's servant. You can think of yourself more highly than others who are not in the courts of the king. But if you're the servant of all, even the lowliest, even the least in this world, in that, there is service, there is service humility. Not just to be servants of one, but to be servants of all. Jesus tells his disciples, if you are to be great, you must be the last of all and the servant of all. In a sense, we are to give up on this pursuit of greatness in this life. Just give up on greatness, friends. That's what Jesus wants us to do, to give up on our desires to make much of ourselves. But instead, we are to pursue humility, pursue the humility of Christ. Now, notice what I said there. We are to pursue humility. I'm not saying we are to be humble or to declare myself that I am humble because I don't think that is attainable in this life. I don't think it's possible for us to fully attain humility. You know, I've heard it said, there's this old joke about someone who would says, you know, I would be absolutely perfect in every way except for my overabundance of humility, right? That's not humility whatsoever. That's, that's someone who doesn't get it. That's not being humble. To say, oh, I'm humble, you just don't get it. None of us will ever attain humility, but we ought to pursue humility and the humility of Christ. It's an ongoing active process. We must make progress in it over and over again. You will never enter fully and completely into humility, but you can pursue it moment by moment, breath by breath, day by day. And what is humility? It's honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness we must honestly assess ourselves in light of God's holiness and in our sinfulness. And we must pursue true humility. Not a false humility that would say, oh, woe is me and I'm horrible, but to really understand our position before a holy God, understanding our own sinfulness. And Jesus tells us, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Give up on the pursuit of greatness and instead 
pursue the humility of Christ. And then Jesus goes on to give us some practical examples of what that looks like. Verses 36 and 37, and he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to his disciples, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. What does he do? He gathers this child, takes him in his arms and tells his disciples to receive this little one. Now, this is a little different for us. Today, we honor our kids. In fact, sometimes we go so far as to worship our children. And that's probably in the church more than out in the world because out in the world, we worship our pets. We think they are our kids and that sort of thing. But in the church, often it's our kids and we have a high esteem and put high value on our children. And that's good. Our children are wonderful blessings from the Lord. But in Jesus' day, children were irrelevant, insignificant. There was a culture of, of high infant mortality. And so often kids weren't even named until they were years old. And then it wasn't until they had reached a particular age where dad would begin to take notice of them. Until that time, insignificant, absolutely irrelevant, as if they didn't really even exist. Truly, children were some of the least in society in Jesus' day. And who is it that Jesus wraps around in his arms and uses an example of humility? It's this little child. He receives this child. He brings him into his arms and says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. What does it mean to receive a child? To accept, to welcome, to acknowledge them, to see them as having value and worth, and to to see them as being more worthy than myself. That is what Jesus is getting at here, that we must receive even the most insignificant, irrelevant people in our day, to consider them and their needs and their value, to consider them more highly than we consider our own selves. He's saying, you are not as important, or he, yeah, he's saying, What Jesus is trying to teach us is that we're not to look at ourselves as more important than them, but to say that they are more important than we are. And this is an act of humility. Not to say they are lesser than us, but they are greater, of more value, of more worth than we are. And we are to receive these little ones, these insignificant ones, into our arms, into our lives, into our existence, to receive them as we would receive Christ. These children are, we've used this phrase before, the worthless to me type of person. That doesn't mean they are worthless, but they're they're worthless to me. Meaning they don't bring a lot to the relationship. They don't give me a lot of benefit, a lot of value. I don't gain much from being around them necessarily. These are what these children are in that context. Worthless to me types of people. Who are the worthless to me types of people in our day, in your own life? Maybe there's a neighbor of yours who's, Worthless to you doesn't mean they are worthless, doesn't mean they have no value, but to you, you don't get much from that relationship. How can you pursue humility and receive them as you would receive Christ? What about the homeless in our day? What about widows, often the unforgotten people in our, or the forgotten people in our, uh, in our day, in our churches? What will it look like for you to live a life as a disciple who pursues humility and who receives those people who might be worthless to you. This is what it looks like to pursue humility, to receive these worthless to me types of people, to receive those who seem insignificant, to consider them more worthy and better than ourselves. This is the object lesson that Jesus gives us here. He takes a child in his arms and says, receive this child. And the one who receives this child in my name receives me and receives the one who sent me. But the story goes on and we continue to see failures of the disciples again. John doesn't seem to get it yet because in verse 38, John blurts out, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Interesting that in these three predictions of Jesus' death and these three uh, evidences of failures of the disciples, the three of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John are all named. It was Peter a couple weeks ago. Here we have John. And then in the future, we're gonna see James and John in this moment of failure. You see, it doesn't matter your position around Jesus or how high you've climbed, you can still fall pretty hard back down into humility. And John just doesn't seem to get this calling towards humility yet. He says, teacher, we saw someone casting out your name and so we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Notice that. John's not concerned with someone following Jesus. He's concerned with someone following him. 
You see, John wants to be the gatekeeper of these exorcisms, which is so ironic because in the last story, they failed at casting out a demon. But yet here, John's trying to shut it down and saying, if you're not following me, if you're not following my way, if you're not following the way I want to do it, you can't do that. You got to come through me if you want to practice these exorcisms in Jesus' name. And here we see this pride, this lack of humility. Pride has blind, blinded John to his ineffectual ability, his, his lack of ability to exercise the demons. But he wants them to be shut down. He says, Lord, we told this man, almost to brag, Lord, we told this man to stop casting out demons in your name because he was not following us. And so here again, Jesus has to correct. And he says in verse 39, do not stop him. For the one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon after to speak, will not soon able to be after to speak. Okay, I need to read it again, sorry. Verse 39, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Essentially, Jesus is saying here, listen, John, disciples, you don't have the, good, you don't have the market corner on good works of the kingdom. There will be others who will do the good works of the kingdom. It's, a good, it's good to desire to do those things. It's good to want to see those things done in this world, but you must walk humbly, realizing that God will use other people to do his works in this world. The focus here of John is on himself and on the disciples in his pride, in his lack of humility, in his desire to want to be the greatest. And Jesus says, listen, other people will come, will do great works in the kingdom. So do not stop them. Do not hinder those who are outside of your circle from the works of the Lord. We don't want to hinder others in our day from doing the works of the Lord. How do you respond to that? How does that sit with you? You know, sometimes I see competition between churches. I see us wanting to say, we want to do those things. It's our job to do those things. And you over there, you other church, we're in competition with you for people and for resources and for works in our community and that sort of stuff. And we lack partnership with them because we want to be the ones doing the works of God. And Jesus says, don't stop them. Let them do these things in my name because if they're doing them in my name, they cannot speak evil of me. Jesus gives us some examples of humility. He tells us that disciples are to pursue humility, that if anyone would be first, if anyone wants to be great in the kingdom of heaven, he must be last of all and the servant of all. And so we, friends, are to give up on greatness in this life and to instead pursue humility. Humility, humility in our status, in our standing, in our community. Humility towards the least, those ones who are insignificant. Humility towards those who are worthless to me types of people. And humility towards those who might be outside of our circle of influence, those who might see as different or other, or to be humble towards them. There are temptations in pride for all of us. We want status. We want to think that we are better than others. We want to think of only those who are in our circle. But Jesus says, if you want to be great, pursue humility as I have done. And so disciples are to pursue humility. And then Jesus shifts gears a little bit in his teaching about discipleship. And he begins to teach on not just pursuing humility, but also pursuing holiness. And we see the teaching of Jesus as he calls us, calls his disciples to be holy and humble. Look at verses 42 through 50. Jesus says this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and be thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell to the unquenchable fire. And he talks about cutting off our foot, gouging out our eyes, all for the sake of holiness. Now notice here, this is all one big teaching of Jesus. There is no pause, there is no break, there is no scene change. This is all one teaching. It's all in response to this question of who is the greatest. And Jesus begins to teach about pursuing not just humility, but pursuing holiness. And he goes back to the image of these little ones, these little children, and says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, what's a millstone? Probably not something we have in our day, is it? Anyone grinding up grain in their, their home, you know, doing the little mortise and pestle thing or anyone doing that sort of stuff today? 
Maybe you are, but most of the time we go get our ground grains, our flour, and those sorts of things from the store. It's already done for us. We have big, massive machines that do that type of thing. In Jesus' day, they used millstones. And in his day, he's probably referring to big, huge wheels, these cylindrical stones, sometimes up to a meter in diameter, that, that ox and beasts of burden would pull along the threshing floor and would grind up the grain. And that's how they would grind their things to make flour so they could have bread. Now, these things were massive. They were huge, easily 500, 1,000 pounds, maybe even more, 1,500 pounds. Massive, huge stones that only big beasts of burden could move around. And Jesus says, pursue the holiness of others. Allow others to pursue holiness. Allow others to walk in purity and don't cause them to stumble. If you cause anyone to stumble, better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and to be thrown into the sea than to cause that little one to sin. Friends, we should take that to heart. We should understand the dangers of causing others to stumble into sin by our pride, our arrogance, by our lack of purity, by our lack of holiness. Jesus says it'd be better for us to drown in the sea than to cause a little one to sin. And then he ups the ante even more and talks about not just the holiness of others, but our own personal purity and holiness. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to go with two hands into hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Pursue a radical holiness just as he is holy. And if something causes you to sin, if there's temptation in your life, then you need to get rid of it. You need to throw it away. You need to cut it off for it is far better for you to do that than it is for you to enter into the than for you to be whole and enter into hell. Far better to enter the kingdom of God maimed than to enter into the kingdom of Satan whole. And Jesus says that if you do not do these things, where is the danger? Where might we end up? Well, in hell itself. Better to lose a hand, an eye, a foot than to go into the hell where it's unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. You know, sometimes people ask, is hell a literal place? Is it really a place of fire and torment and those sorts of things? Jesus sure seems to think so. Jesus sure seems to teach about that in many, many places, and here specifically. And some people object to this idea of fire and that sort of thing. Say it's just an analogy. But if that is the analogy, how much worse is that place in reality? If fire is the best way we can use to describe that place, the best thing Jesus can use to teach about the eternal punishment of hell, how much worse will it be? Jesus says that it's better that we cut off our arm, our hand, our foot, than to go in that place of unquenchable fire. And he quotes in this place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched from the end of Isaiah that talks about this rebellion of the people against God who will one day find judgment in God when God comes, when his kingdom comes, and in that place, there will be worms that do not die and the fire will not be quenched. What Jesus is trying to show us here is the severity of sin and of our need to pursue holiness. That if we do not put sin to death, this is where it will lead to our ultimate destruction. That's why John Owen, famous Puritan pastor, said famously, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. As disciples, we must pursue holiness. We must be radical about killing sin in our lives. And it is better to lose so many things in this life in the pursuit of holiness than to have those and miss the kingdom of God. What causes temptation in your life? What are the things that pull you away from the kingdom of God? Get rid of those things. Be radical in pursuing holiness. Jesus says to cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, slice your foot away, get rid of those things that might cause you to sin and pursue the kingdom of God rather than be thrown into hell. So what is it that causes temptation in your life? Get rid of it, my friends. You know, Chris Marriage was preaching a few weeks ago and he brought this story of of the person who's struggling with pornography and the pastor tells them to, you know, get rid of your phone cut out the internet, get rid of your computer. And and Chris was mentioning, man, 
Rarely, if ever, has that happened. Rarely do people get rid of those things so radically in their lives. We justify and say, well, I want to keep this. I need to have this. I, I should keep this in my life. And we, we remain in that moment of temptation when we should be radical in getting rid of those things in our lives. What is it for you? If you're tempted with something like pornography, then get rid of your phone, your computer, your TV, whatever it is that would pull you into that. If you're tempted towards anxiety because of social media and news, then just get off of those things. Throw them away. Be done with them. Destroy those things in your life. If you're tempted with gluttony, then don't buy the things that would cause you to overeat and, and put your trust in and find your pleasure in all of those things. What is it in your life that is causing you these temptations or leading you towards temptation? Get rid of them. Be radical in throwing them away. And instead, Pursue holiness, the holiness of Christ. What Jesus is trying to teach us here is that we must be radical in fighting sin. You need this. This is a work that we need to do. I need to do this. I need to pursue a radical holiness and forsake the things that would tempt us in this life. We must pursue holiness and we must understand what it may cost us. Discipleship is costly. Jesus tells us earlier, it will cost you your life. It will cost you your status. It will cost you your pride. It will require radical humility, a radical pursuit of holiness. It is costly, but friends, it is so worth it. The kingdom of God is far better than anything this world or the kingdom of Satan could offer us. And Jesus goes on to teach about being salted with fire and, and all that sort of thing. Let me just say that this speaks to the sacrificial system. Jesus has in mind here, I think, the sacrifices of old. Salt and fire were often sacrifices. And the point here is that these forsaking of, of the temptations of this life, the costly things that we lay down to pursue holiness, they are like our sacrifice to the Lord Almighty, our spiritual act of worship. They're symbolic of the offerings we make as disciples to God. And so what Jesus is teaching us here is that we need to pursue holiness, pursue humility. And it is costly, but it is the way that we worship God. And so the disciples are to do this. They're to pursue holiness and purity as they pursue the Lord together. And there's a connection here between humility and holiness. I just really quickly, I just want to make sure you see this connection. Radical holiness requires radical humility. If you're going to get rid of your phone, your computer, your TV, whatever it is, get rid of those things that would tempt you, people are going to notice that. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. People are going to look at you differently. They're going to look at you weird. And it's going to require a lot of humility on your part to say, yeah, here is why I've gotten rid of those things in my life. They're pulling me away from Jesus and towards the kingdom of Satan. Radical holiness requires a radical humility. And radical humility leads to greater holiness and purity. Killing pride is a way we defeat sin in our lives and leads us towards greater holiness. And day by day, we should rise pursuing humility, thanking God that we can grow in it day by day. And morning after morning, we should rise pursuing a radical holiness in this life and thanking God that we can grow in it. And how are we to do that? How do we pursue this humility and this holiness? Well, friends, it begins by looking to Jesus who's the perfect example of both holiness and humility. This was Jesus' life. He was perfect in humility in every single way, and he was perfectly obedient to the Father in every single way, perfectly holy, never sinning, not once, not ever. He was always serving, never being served, always considering the needs of others, always considering others greater and more worthy than himself. He was humble and he was holy. And so we must look to him as the one who makes possible our holiness, who makes possible our humility. It is Jesus' death on the cross, his example in this life and his humble death that show us what humility looks like. We must look to Jesus if we're to walk in holiness. This is what Jesus is teaching. This is what Mark wants us to see, the connection between Jesus' death and resurrection and our humility and holiness. We look to Jesus to see the perfect example of holiness and humility. You see, Jesus came into this world to rescue us. 
He came to exercise our demons, to cast them out. He came to defeat Satan, to deliver us from the kingdom of Satan. He's the one who goes to bind the strong man, to plunder his house, to rescue us out of that. And because of Jesus, we no longer remain captive to Satan and our sin. And Jesus went to the cross to die, to forgive us of our sinfulness, so that the condemnation no longer would have power over us. Freely we are forgiven so that we might live free from the shackles of sin's consequences. And Jesus rose in victorious power. He sent the Holy Spirit into our lives to empower us to live life in the kingdom. Not only are we forgiven, not only are we given mercy, but we're given the grace of the Lord and the Holy Spirit who now indwells us, who lives inside of us, who gives us the power to follow after Jesus. How is it that we can pursue humility? How we can pursue holiness as disciples? We turn and we follow Jesus, who is both our example and the one who empowers us. These are not works we can do on our own, friends. We cannot deliver ourselves. We cannot just work harder at being humble, work harder at being holy. We must receive Jesus' gift of mercy and grace. We must receive his righteousness. We must receive his spirit to empower us to turn from these these prideful things turn from our sin towards humility and holiness. And so if we want to grow in these things, it begins by looking to Jesus, the one who is truly great, the one who humbled himself, the one who walked in perfect holiness is the one who is truly great. Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Do you want to be great in Jesus' eyes? Then look to Jesus the one who tells us about the way of greatness, which is to pursue humility and holiness. Do you wanna be great? Pursue humility. Give up on greatness in this life. Consider more others more highly than you consider yourself. Be a servant. Receive those who are least. Receive those who are outsiders. Receive those worthless to me types of people. Practice humility, following after Jesus, looking to him, and you will be great in the kingdom. A disciple pursues the humility of Christ. Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Then pursue holiness. Take sin seriously. Do whatever is necessary to be killing sin, lest it be killing you. Cut off your hand if necessary. Chop off your foot. Gouge out your eye. Do whatever you must do to pursue a radical holiness. That may be uncomfortable. That may even be humiliating at times. But that is what disciples must do. Pursue the holiness of Christ and the empowerment of the Spirit. Disciples are to pursue the holiness of Christ. And so if we want to be great, we must look to Jesus, to follow after Jesus, to be his disciple, the one who died for us, the one who empowers us. Jesus is the truly great one, and so we must look to him as our example of humility and holiness. Let me close our time together this morning with just a reading from Philippians chapter two, where we see the humility of Christ, the obedience of Christ, and the glorification of Christ because of these things, as we see the one who is truly great. Paul writes in Philippians two, verses one through 10. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though is in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May we look to Jesus, the truly great one, the one who is now ruling and reigning, the one who was humble, the one who was obedient, the one who walked in perfect holiness, who was a sacrifice to us, whom God has now glorified. May we look to him, the truly great one, who because of his humility and holiness 
is exalted and empowers us to walk in the kingdom of heaven. May we look to Jesus, our example. May we pursue him, pursuing his holiness and his humility. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we are so thankful for Jesus. We're so thankful for his life of humility, for his humble obedience, for his perfect life of holiness and righteousness. Lord, we are thankful that he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. They did not think of himself more highly than he ought, but instead lived a radical life of humility. And God, we're thankful for his obedience, that he was obedient in all things, even to the point of death on a cross, that he would be a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Truly, he is the great and awesome one. He's the one who is truly great, Lord. And God, we glory in the fact that he is now highly exalted above all, that he's been given the name above every name, and that he now rules and reigns over all things. And we see in him the greatness of the kingdom of God that comes by pursuing humility and holiness. And Lord, you help us now to look to Jesus, not to pursue greatness in this life, but rather to follow his example and pursue humility, to pursue his holiness. Would you help us to forsake our pride in this life, to forsake the sins of this world? Would you help us to focus on the truly great one who is Jesus and to find greatness in your kingdom through our union with him? Help us pursue humility. Help us walk in holiness. Help us to look to Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.